Hello everyone and welcome by IPSA Foundation for Scientific Research. Our mission is based on three main activities that are educational, art and science and culture and health because uh, we, we like to promote the culture of frontier science and uh, to do that uh, we organize a lot of um, forums uh, we uh, large every year uh, scholarships and fellowships for young researchers and uh, we like to disseminate uh, science culture through activities like uh, a contamination by art and science. Uh, in collaboration with Professor Franco Cavalli, uh, we, we are pleased to, to invite special guests every year uh, for the International Conference of Malignant uh, Lymphoma in uh, Lugano. And uh, for these special occasions, uh, this year we have a very special guest. So now I ask to Professor Ali Monti, um, component of our scientific board, to introduce our guest. Thank you and uh, have a nice lecture. Hello everyone, uh, on behalf of the uh, IPSA Foundation, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, this, uh, the speaker of this section, Professor Rino Rappoli. Professor Rappoli is a Chief Scientific Officer at GSK Vaccine in Siena, Italy, and is a Professor of Vaccine Research at the Imperial College of London. Professor Rappoli is a member of the US National Academy of Science and the European Molecular Biology Organization at the Royal Society of London. He's considered one of the most important or relevant scientists in the field of uh, uh, vaccine research. So today, uh, Professor Rappoli is going to discuss about the role of uh, novel uh, um, COVID vaccine and uh, the development uh, discovery of monoclonal antibody for the, the, uh, the prevention and therapy of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, to Professor Rapoli, uh, the stage is yours. Well, good morning, everybody. Today, we're gonna talk about vaccines and monoclonals and how they will uh, help us to regain our freedom. Uh, we'll get back to this title at the end of my talk so that we'll be clear what I mean. Uh, we're going to talk about pandemic. Uh, when I talk about pandemics, I always start uh, my talk with this slide. This slide shows the view of Siena, the city where I live in Tuscany, Italy. And the reason to start with that is because Siena uh, has a long history with pandemics. And uh, I think it's sometimes useful to go back and see how pandemic, what the pandemics did in the past. Uh, to understand what happens in Siena, we need to go back to 1348. Uh, 1348, uh, Siena uh, was one of the most powerful uh, economies of the time. It was located between Rome and Northern Europe. Uh, all the traffic was going to the city. They've been very good in uh, uh, establishing trade, uh, hospital, uh, the uh, banking, uh, and the city was very rich. Everybody was stopping there. And uh, like it happens in rich cultures, basically uh, architects, poets, uh, painters uh, were uh, going to Siena, a lot of really flourishing culture. And uh, in Siena was the school of uh, Siena, the first school of painting that happened in the Middle Age. And you will see a beautiful picture of Ambrosio Lorenzetti in 1330. And in this atmosphere of rich, uh, flourishing culture, and basically the Sinis decided to, they wanted to do something spectacular, something will remain forever. And they decided to build the largest cathedral ever built. Uh, at that time, building the largest cathedral meant uh, building something that will tell the power of the city. Today, I think if you will wanted to show your power, you build the tallest building in the, in the world. At that time, it was the largest cathedral. So they started, 
and uh, 1348, they started building, and they were building the facade of the cathedral. Here you see what they were building. Uh, the facade of the cathedral was uh, monumental, huge, and was facing south, basically telling to the people coming from Rome, look, I mean, you are entering the city as such, such a powerful cathedral. But unfortunately, in May 2038, what happened was the Black Death, the plague, arrived to Siena. And then basically in three months, from May to September, killed two thirds of the population. Uh, the architects died, the painters died, the populations died, the city was not rich anymore. And basically that dream was never finished. And today we have this wall, which is left from 1348, which has never been finished. And the cathedral a couple of centuries later was done, was much smaller than the original dream, still big, it's like beautiful, but nothing compared to the cathedral was supposed to be. Um, this is the inside uh, from the same wall. Uh, this was supposed to be the inside of the cathedral. Uh, and I call this wall the largest monument to infectious disease ever built. Because, because a, a microbe uh, not visible basically can uh, get to a flourishing economy, uh, destroy the economy, kill the people, and change the history forever. Uh, that's the history of uh, 1348 in Siena. So what's the difference between that and Siena uh, and uh, in Siena 1348 and uh, the pandemic we are living now? Well, if we look at mortality, this is from Brazil, but now we have the, the, the what's happening in India, uh, more than 3 million deaths. Uh, the impact uh, is huge. The impact in economy is huge. Uh, it's been calculated this pandemic has already costed 16 trillion uh, to the global economy. Maybe it's gonna cost 28 trillion, which will be twice the uh, GDP of the United States. Huge cost and huge things. What's the difference between uh, 1348 and today? Well, if you look back at 2020, Basically, the only tools we had in 2020 to face the pandemic are quarantine, social distance, and hygiene. Now, very different from what people in Siena had in 1348. And they also could quarantine people, and apply social distancing, and, and use hygiene. Uh, the difference is coming in 2021, because in 2020, we basically applied uh, all the science, all the technology we have today to develop vaccines and monoclonals. And those are now solving uh, the problem. They are basically uh, allowing us to basically control the COVID-19. Uh, and this has been possible uh, thanks to two things. The huge technology uh, the development that we had the last few years, and by an unprecedented investment uh, by the public sector in development and manufacturing. I will touch both of them because they are both important to understand why we have been able to uh, develop such tools for uh, the pandemic in such a short period of time. Um, let's start from the technologies. Here is a summary. All the technologies have been used to make vaccines during the last century and a half. Basically, we started with a very empirical approach to vaccination. And this empirical approach was basically uh, meant growing bacteria, viruses, uh, and killing them, and injecting them. Then we started to have new waves of technologies, 1980, recombinant DNA, like conjugation, uh, genomics, reverse vaccinology. And today we have an explosion of new technologies that are basically changing every day the way we develop uh, uh, vaccines and, and uh, other tools. Um, so far, so much that I believe that uh, today we can do things that five years ago we were not able to make. And I believe in five years, we'll be able to do things that is difficult even to dream about today. That's such as the evolutionary technology. Now, for COVID-19, basically there have been four technologies that really made the difference. And those are summarized in this slide. 
Number one is what I call internet-based vaccines. Number two is uh, what I call structural vaccinology. Three is the synthetic biology, the ability to make synthetic RNAs. And four is the ability to use adjuvants. Now, um, I will uh, we'll see all these technologies, but the, uh, I will spend one slide on the what I call internet-based vaccines. Um, to understand that, we need to go back to 2013. Yesterday, 2013, uh, basically the Chinese CDC put in the internet uh, the sequence of the genome of an influenza strain that was potentially pandemic. Um, we were coming after the 2009 influenza pandemic when to make vaccines, we had to uh, wait for the virus to be available. The virus then was shipped to CDC and, and then CDC basically used the virus to make reassortants. A few months later, it was sent, the virus was sent to uh, the vaccine manufacturers and basically eventually vaccines were made. But the, by the time the vaccines were made, the uh, pandemic, the peak of the pandemic was over. Um, so we need a new way of making vaccines. And in 2013, the Easter day, when the, basically the Chinese put on the internet the sequence of this a new virus, which is an avian virus, potentially pandemic, um, at that time I was collaborating with Craig Benter. We were in California, in San Diego, basically on Monday Easter, he uh, synthesized the two genes uh, of the new virus, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. On Monday night, he's put those two genes into uh, express mail uh, and send it to our laboratories in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, at that time, uh, next day, on Tuesday morning, we started to use those synthetic genes to make uh, two things, one RNA vaccine and one uh, virus, uh, synthetic virus that basically uh, the, to be used for, to make conventional vaccines. And basically in one week, basically in six days, we are able to have an RNA vaccine ready to go. And we are able to have a new uh, synthetic virus to make conventional vaccine. So that was the first time where basically a vaccine was made, starting from the information teleported through the internet and without seeing the original virus. Um, that was, a, from my point of view, the transition from what I call analogic vaccines to digital vaccines. Basically, in the analogic vaccines before that day, to make a vaccine, you needed a virus, a, a bacteria, or a parasite, and only if you are able to grow and uh, then you are able to make a vaccine. Uh, from that moment, basically, uh, we didn't need anymore uh, to the real viruses. We just need information. Uh, information teleported through internet, designed by computer to make synthetic genes, and then you can make uh, vaccines. So that's the technology which has really allowed us to make vaccines very quickly. The other thing which has really made an incredible acceleration in vaccine development has been the investment of the public sector. Basically, public sector, mostly the US government, uh, with more than 10 billion, but also Europe, the UK, Japan, uh, have put together uh, more or less 15 billion, which has been extremely important. Why is that important? Well, to understand that, we need to do to understand the vaccine development. Here you see that when we develop vaccines, usually we start from discovery, and once we have proof of concept, the discovery works, uh, then we start early development, clinical trial phase one, phase two. And when we finish that, then we start the phase three, the largest part of the development, and where you basically do large clinical trials, you uh, establish the efficacy, you build the manufacturing plan, and so on. All these things, overall, they cost more, more or less a billion or more. Obviously, uh, you never do the next investment unless the first one is successful, because otherwise you will throw away your money. What has changed this time? This time changed that the government, the public sector came in, they said, you in the companies usually do discovery, then phase one, phase two, and phase three sequentially, and takes you 
basically between 10 and 20 years to make a vaccine. We cannot do that. I, the public sector, I'm going to take the risk. Here's the money for you, and you do everything in parallel. So you do uh, discovery. As soon as you have a, an idea that your discovery works, you start at phase one. As soon, soon you have safety for say one, you do phase two. As soon as you have uh, safety and you have selected those, you do a phase three. And you do everything in parallel. And the government, the public sector, is taking the financial risk. Uh, and that allowed us to get the developed vaccines in 10 months. Uh, it's important to understand that while uh, there was a, a huge risk on the uh, money invested, because if it didn't work, the, man, the money was thrown away, uh, the, in doing this parallel development, no risk was taken on the safety of the vaccines. So I think that's the uh, message uh, I wanted to give. That's why we went so fast. The vaccines were made basically at three types of vaccines. Basically, the uh, internet, making synthetic gene, and then the synthetic gene was used to make three types of vaccines. RNA vaccines, completely synthetic. They were, were able to go to the clinic in 66 days. Uh, viral vector, the synthetic gene is put into a vector. And then the vector is grown and used as a vaccine. Or uh, the synthetic gene is used to engineer a, a cell, uh, a plant cells, a, a mammalian cells, or insect cells. And then you uh, ferment the cell, you purify the protein, and the purified proteins mix with an adjuvant, and you make a vaccine. So these are the three types of vaccines that we made mostly, and this all derive from the synthetic gene. Uh, how do they look like? Here you see uh, all the companies made the viral vectors, the RNAs, and the proteins plus adjuvants. In terms of immunogenicity, uh, in order to understand how they look like, you need to look at this blue bar. This is the basically the titers uh, of neutralizing antibodies found in convalescent patients. So, if, bottom line, if you have antibodies above this blue line, you're supposed to be protected. And as you can see, all the vaccines are uh, above this blue line, so they all induce protective antibodies. Uh, but indeed, viral vectors, uh, antibodies are lower than RNA, which is lower than spike proteins. Today, not only we have the immunogenicity, we also have the efficacy, and we know that basically the uh, RNA vaccines and the no, uh, protein plus adjuvant vaccine from Novavax are, have efficient uh, efficacy of 95% or more, while the viral vectors are slow, slightly lower between 60 and 90% efficacy. However, all of them have more than 90% efficacy against uh, prevention of severe disease and hospitalization. So vaccines, it's a nice story. Now we have more than a billion doses of vaccines already delivered, and we are doing pretty well in slowing down this pandemic. Um, while we were happy about the deploying of the vaccines, we started to get the variants. The virus started to change, and we got the Denmark, Brazil, UK, uh, and then we got South Africa, uh, and now we have the Indian variants and so on. And the question is, will these uh, variants be able to escape from vaccines? Um, well, to summarize that, this is my vision. Uh, at the beginning, we had a virus growing and, uh, and basically circulating across the world. It was doing very well, did not need to change. But as soon as people started to have some immunity, the virus started to uh, find constraints in growing people that already been uh, infected by the virus. And so basically, uh, the virus had to escape natural immunity. And basically, uh, it did by uh, mutating the spike protein in several different places. Uh, so the virus has been able to escape uh, natural immunity by uh, basically changing the spike protein. And now, 
with the vaccines, we are basically putting first generation, second generation vaccines, we are basically putting back the virus into jail. Now the vaccine are pretty secure and we believe between first and second generation vaccines, the virus will be controlled by vaccination. But you know, this virus surprised us a couple of times. So we need to be careful and make sure that we don't have open windows by which the virus can still escape. But so far the prediction is that the vaccines will be able to control even the variants. And we'll need probably boosters, we'll need uh, second generation vaccines with some of the, including some of the variants, but we'll be able to do it. So I think this is what I wanted to tell about vaccines. And now I'm gonna talk about the other part of the um, immunization, which is basically the passive immunization. Passive immunization is uh, not new. I mean, the first time was discovered in 1890, and Emil von Behring got the first Nobel Prize uh, in medicine because he discovered that the serum against diphtheria toxin was able to protect people from, uh, saving people from death uh, due to diphtheria. And um, we've been using sera for passive immunization during the last century. Um, only at the end of the century, we stopped to use uh, most of the sera. And today we have replaced the sera with human monoclonal antibodies. Now, uh, the human monoclonal antibodies are not, are largely used in, uh, uh, in I mean, there are more than 100 products licensed and they're used for cancer, for uh, autoimmunity, inflammation, not really much used in uh, infectious diseases. The reason is that even infectious diseases, the way we made human monoclonal antibodies uh, was not, has been improving a lot recently. And basically, in 1990s, this is the case of HIV, our antibodies that we could make at that time, like B12, were quite uh, inefficient. Then in 10 years, we basically developed new monoclonal antibodies, which are 10 times more potent. Then we got another 10 times more potent. And today we are able to make human monoclonal antibodies against HIV, they are a thousand times more potent than they were used to be. So with this new technology, which is quite recent, uh, was uh, just available when uh, the COVID pandemic arrived. And so we decided, we and others decided to make human monoclonal antibodies using the latest technologies. And the way we did that is basically we took blood from convalescent patients uh, from the University of Siena, the Instituto Spallanzani in Rome. We took, uh, we sorted the a single cell, the memory B cells that recognize the spike protein of the virus. And then we cultivated the cells in uh, every single memory B cells recognized the spike protein in uh, wells in, uh, and, and asked whether they were producing neutralizing antibodies. And we uh, tested more than 4,000 memory B cells and we found that 453 of them producing neutralizing antibodies against the virus. Then we look at their potency. Most of the cells were not really, were producing monoclonal antibodies, which were <clears throat> neutralizing, but not really potent. Some intermediate potent, potency, some a little bit better, but <clears throat> out of the 4,000, 2,077 cells, only three were really making very potent, extremely potent human monoclonal antibodies. Uh, <clears throat> they will neutralize the virus below 10 nanograms per ml. Uh, we decided to pick uh, the three of them and eventually picked one for industrial development. And uh, we realized that these monoclonals, well, monoclonal was basically recognizing the tip of the uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein, uh, uh, basically preventing the binding of the virus to the receptor. Well, the selected antibody was then tested in animal models. Uh, for prevention of the infection. Basically, what we did was we gave the monoclonal antibody to hamsters, and then 24 hours later, we infected with the virus. When the, uh, basically the animals that got different doses of the antibody, they basically 
started to grow and ne never lost uh, weight. And uh, this was true for all the doses, even very low doses that we used. The control animals that received nothing like the red line, basically lost waste, weight and never recovered. While the uh, another group where we gave an antibody against influenza, which was supposed was not supposed to do anything, also lost, lost weight and never recovered. Finally, we uh, look at whether the what's happening in the lungs, and basically, remarkably, by day three, uh, there was no virus in the lungs of these hamsters anymore, while in the control was plenty of virus. So basically, this antibody that we selected was able to uh, prevent, uh, basically, to neutralize the virus in the in culture and prevent the disease in animals. So we decided to uh, move that. Uh, so here is a, a timeline what we did from the initial, we started in February, basically by June, we had selected the lead antibody. Then we started to make a cell line, industrialize and go for uh, uh, GMP manufacturing actual clinical trials. At this time, we are finished phase one clinical trials. We are in phase two, three and um, in the meantime, uh, the variants came in. And as soon as the variants came in, we had to ask the question whether this, this antibody would be able to control the variants. And indeed, we have been able to see that this is able to control the UK variant, the uh, South African variant, the Brazilian variant. So uh, the antibody that we have is really able to do, uh, to control the variants we have so far. So that's our story. Uh, in the meantime, other groups have been, other industries have been developing antibodies. They're a little bit ahead of us, like Eli Lilly, and they've been showing that basically the Eli Lilly antibodies, uh, they showed 87% efficacy against hospitalization and death, thanks to the antibodies. I have to say that unfortunately the Eli Lilly antibodies are not effective against the variants. So the, this one, uh, the FDA had to remove the approval for this one. Uh, this another uh, uh, group, GSK, VIR, also developed an antibody that's shown 85% efficacy against the hospitalization and death. And recently, Regeneron showed that basically uh, this antibody has 81% efficacy in preventing the disease. So the uh, antibodies are working, they prevent disease, they're going to be very complementary uh, to vaccination because obviously vaccines are very important and effective in preventing disease, but once people are infected, you need a, a therapy and the vaccine is to, it cannot be used for that. So I think the antibodies are perfect complementarity. They have been developed, they have been deployed. And so basically I want to conclude now, going back to the my title, and here I put the Statue of the Liberty because uh, I think that thanks to the technologies, the investment, the scientists, the collaboration has been going on globally. Today, thanks to vaccines and, and human monoclonal antibodies, we can get back our liberty. Why do I talk about liberty and freedom? Well, because this pandemic has taken away our freedom uh, to go out, to walk, to work, to travel to meet friends, to visit relatives, to play sport, to go to theater. And all these things hopefully will come back thanks to the, uh, really the huge global effort to develop vaccines and monoclonals. With that, I want to, just to show you the young guys that have been developing the monoclonal antibodies in our laboratory and the collaborators that helped us basically with the animal models, the cryo-electromicroscopy, uh, the uh, uh, neutralization uh, uh, in the BSL-3 laboratory and so on. Thanking you for your attention.